This time on the hit list, eight acts who are proud to sit a little left of the mainstream. Icelandic oddball Björk landed her first recording contract after her version of the Tina Charles hit I Love to Love was heard on national radio back in 1975. The following year, at just 11, the schoolgirl from Reykjavik released a children's album that sold 5,000 copies. By the time she was 21, she was fronting alternative rock band The Sugar Cubes, who had a surprise hit with their single Birthday in the UK in 1988. A song about a five-year-old girl who has a love affair with a 50-year-old man next door. When The Sugar Cubes split up in 1992, Björk teamed up with Massive Attack producer Nelly Hooper. The partnership spawned her first international solo hit, Human Behaviour, and her album debut, which was declared Album of the Year by music magazine NME. Her pixie looks and unique wailing singing style, combined with techno beats, immediately set her apart from every other act on the 90s scene, and she followed up with more singles like Venus as a Boy and Big Time Sensuality which proved to be a popular remix favourite with DJs and producers. Her second album, Post, explored dance and techno further, but by 1997, she was incorporating sweeping strings into her eclectic sound suite in Homogenic. Alongside the groundbreaking music, she's also made a few waves with her acting efforts, winning a Best Actress Award at Cannes for her performance in the 2001 Lars von Trier musical Dancer in the Dark, for which she also composed the score. Her performance of one of the soundtrack songs at that year's Oscars hit the front pages, thanks to the famous swan dress she wore on stage, which was recently auctioned off on eBay for charity. In 2005, she bravely collaborated with her partner and father of her second son, visual artist Matthew Barney, on a film project called Drawing Restraint 9, set aboard a Japanese whaling ship. You could say we planted seeds for five years without having anything in mind, thinking we would never work together. And then when we started doing this, uh, it was harvest time with kind of all these things popping out. So it, it, um, I, it wasn't really planned. It just kind of naturally became the thing that was natural to do. Despite her childlike appearance and diminutive dimensions, Björk has also made a name for herself for her occasional violent outbursts aimed at the paparazzi. In 1996, she flew at a reporter in Bangkok and had to be dragged off by security. Later the same year, she allegedly tore off a photographer's shirt. She's displayed the same feistiness when it comes to airing her political views. In 2008, she sent China's culture ministry into an apoplectic fit when she dedicated her song Declare Independence to the Tibet freedom movement during a gig in Shanghai. Then in October, she threw her voice behind the campaign to encourage the Icelandic government to take a more environmental approach. I think I'm just one of many people who have stood up and spoken out, and, and, but I have to do it. I will not be able to live with my own conscience when my grandchildren uh, drive around Iceland and it's just full of, you know, like factories and smelters and, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's a, I mean, it would be horrendous, you know. She showed her commitment by donating sales of her single Natura to the cause. With a lineup of Damon Albarn, Alex James, Graham Coxon and Dave Roundtree, Britpopper's Blur first saw the light of day under the name Seymour in 1989. The name change came with the release of their first album, Leisure, in 1991, 
But their real breakthrough came in 1994 with the Beatles and Kinks-influenced Park Life, which brought them their first top five hit, Girls and Boys. The album was pronounced bigger, bolder and narkier than their previous album and helped them to four awards at the Brits. Their rise and rise had coincided with that of Northern Beatles sound alike's Oasis, and the music press fueled the very public rivalry between the two bands, which became known as the Battle of Britpop. Playing along, both bands decided to release singles on the same day, and Blur's Country House ended up outselling the Oasis song Roll With It by 60,000 copies in the first week, earning Blur their first number one single. However, despite the success of their 1995 album The Great Escape, they couldn't compete with the sales of their rivals' release. What's the Story Morning Glory ended up going four times platinum in the US and spelled the end of Blur's popularity with the media. After 1999 and the release of 13, they took a break to pursue other projects. Frontman Damon Albarn ploughed his energy into virtual band The Gorillas with cartoonist Jamie Hewlett, while Graham and Alex worked on solo projects. They got back together in 2003 without Graham to record the atmospheric think tank, which earned them another number one. Finally, in 2009, Graham was coaxed back into the fold. The carrot was the prospect of a reunion concert in London's Hyde Park. And I looked at a couple of performances, and um, there, there are several things that I've, I missed about a Blur Live experience and being uh, the guitar player. And it's just these certain points in songs where there are visual, visual things between Damon and I, Alex and I, um, Dave and I especially, actually, which are sort of things to do with coming in together and things. They're, they're just very boring probably to everybody else, but they, they were always things that, that I would love about the shows. Drummer Dave Roundtree couldn't wait to get back out on stage with his old mates. What we had before was a real energy about our live performances, and that's what we've got. You know, that's what comes to playing together for 15 years. But for bass player Alex James, it was about the music. That I'm left with that kind of I feel is the most sort of valuable thing from all those years is the songs. You know, they're, they're, so it'd be nice to play them again, for all of them. But Damon was giving nothing away about the potential playlist. We've got an idea of a few songs we're going to play, but I think uh, it's just important to really um, give the, a clear picture next summer about, about kind of what we were about and what got us excited and uh, try and play to our strengths, really, uh, and, uh, you know, spread a little happiness, really. While Björk has been ruling the kooky roost over in Europe, Fiona Apple has been doing an impressive job of shaking things up in the US. While accepting the 1997 MTV Video Music Award for Best New Artist, she launched into a tirade that railed against the mainstream music industry and told fans they shouldn't model their lives on what they think their favorite artist thinks is cool. She followed up her hugely successful debut title in 1999 with an album whose full title stretched to a whopping 90 words. Its extreme length earned Fiona a mention in the Guinness Book of Records, and the album, more informally referred to as When the Porn, garnered great reviews and boosted her burgeoning following. But that didn't stop the unpredictable star from launching into a verbal attack on critics and her audience during a gig in New York, before ending her performance early and storming off stage. When she showed up at an in-store appearance to promote her 2005 album, Extraordinary Machine, nobody knew quite what to expect. Even Fiona seemed a little confused. I have no idea why I'm doing it. Um, because I, you know, I know what my part of the job is. I'm supposed to write songs and sing them and, uh, you know, do what the, you know, I, there's other people that know what they're doing and they say to do it and so I'm doing it. Um, I guess it's, you know, if I have a reason for myself, I guess it's, you know, 
I mean, I, I, you know what, I have no idea. Reporters were keen to know why she'd taken six years to produce a follow-up to When the Porn. I wanted to redo the songs. I was told that in order to do that, I would basically have to do uh, one song at a time. And I found that unacceptable, so I said I'd rather do none of them. And then after a while, some people made a stink about me not having an album out. And then I got a call saying that I could do them all at once instead of doing them one at a time. And that's all I wanted anyway, so that's what happened. All the record company battles paid off, with Extraordinary Machine becoming the highest charting album of Fiona's career and earning her a Grammy nomination. At a record store appearance to promote their self-titled debut album, electronic rockers Casabayan tried to put their finger on what they were bringing to the British scene. Ectoplasm. Ectoplasm rock. Like Ghostbusters, we cross streams. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're trying to fight the ghosts off and you can't cross streams, but somehow we do. So we blend all music together and we've crossed crossing that line. And we call it ectoplasm rock. Very 80s, but it goes, I think. That goes very well. Yeah. Barely had the album hit the shelves than they were on the road headlining sold-out concerts and festivals. They also went over big in Japan. Not that all the sudden success surprised their front man. Not being totally arrogant or anything, or, you know, we're just believing ourselves from the start. I'm not surprised, no, because apart from the Libertines, you know, or Franz Ferdinand, there's no one else doing anything in Britain and British music. No one's pushing it forward, no one's to take those steps. Often compared to 90s Manchester group The Stone Roses, they named themselves after Linda Casabayan, the member of the Charles Manson cult who served as a getaway driver. The overweening confidence of the boys who'd been playing together since school was put to the test as they set about conjuring up follow-up success with their second album, Empire. There wasn't a lot of pressure. We went into the studio with five songs. So that was a little bit of pressure on Sergio's behalf to write another, <laughs> another half an album. But it just kind of came out and just, mm. it just, it's what we do. Do you know what I mean? There's no pressure in breathing or anything. It's, uh, it's just what you do. The title track appeared to focus on the horrors of war. And our song's about rebellion against rock and roll empire. It's not about anti-war and all that. It's, it's just that he used that for, so we could get it together, you see? It's not, you know, we never, this, we never signed forms that said anti-war, you know, it's... We're we, anti-establishment, innit, anti kind of thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like going up against something. We're, so going up, we're, we're, against, we're going against rock and roll, you know? After hitting the road to support the album, they proved there was substance behind all the swaggering self-confidence by taking out the 2007 NME Award for Best Live Act. In 2009, they were out with their third album, West Rider Pauper Lunatic Asylum. Perhaps stating the obvious, the band's principal songwriter, Sergio Pizzorno, explained the wordy title. Yeah, it came from the first uh, poor uh, asylum built for people that couldn't afford to pay because they were going insane. <laughs> and, I, you know, that's, that's why it's called that. This time around, they seemed a little more mellow, if not more humble. It was lovely, it was easy, really, because, you know, we took some time out and, you know, just made a great record, you know, that's about it, really, you know. In 2008, English pop-rock duo Ting Tings apparently came from nowhere to being billed as one of the hottest acts of the year. Consisting of telegenic singer Katie White and drummer Jules DiMartino, their second single, That's Not My Name, knocked Madonna's four minutes off the top of the UK singles chart, while their debut LP, We Started Nothing, was also headed for number one. Two years earlier, the pair were penniless and contemplating their future in the music business. After their previous incarnation, Dear Eskimo, were dropped by Mercury without releasing a solitary record. The pair's bitter experiences of rejection directly inspired the lyrics to That's Not My Name, a gutsy pop song aimed at those who failed to recognise their abilities. You first hear it and you think it's a, a big, catchy pop record, which I think hopefully it is, but, but when we wrote it, we really meant every word of it. We were quite... Um, frustrated at the time and felt quite um, forgettable and you know unconfident and we'd been in a band before this one that hadn't worked out and you know it was quite disillusioned by everything 
So yeah, it was just a song to make ourselves feel better. They felt even better upon seeing the audience reaction. Within 10 seconds of the song playing, you could see that people automatically wanted to like the song and wanted to like the band and we put it on MySpace and you know, we only released 500 vinyl copies of it ourselves um, when we first started and it just went all around the world. The former art and fashion students honed their sound while working in the hothouse conditions of the Islington Mill Artist community near Manchester. Bucking a structured approach to writing, they abided by their own strict rules. We don't write material. Um, how we wrote this album, it was like uh, we had a, we'd have an idea and then go into a studio and we'd give it two hours and if we didn't get that kind of instant fix, scrapped it. And I think that's the way we work. We don't like to kind of have, you know, dictaphones full of songs and we go back and revisit something that was maybe written a year ago because I don't. When we revisit, we're at a different time in our lives. Whatever they've been doing, it's been working for them. With several of their songs appearing on TV shows in America. They're already well on their way to cracking the US. And since completing their first worldwide tour, they've started working on a follow-up album in Paris. Indie rock band Razorlight were formed by Johnny Burrell in London in 2002. Their support gigs for the Libertines and radio airplay of their demos sparked a race to sign them that was won by Mercury Records. Following the release of the number nine single, Golden Touch, their debut album received good reviews from the press and peaked at number three on the UK chart. On the eve of the release of their follow-up single, Vice, Johnny was feeling the pressure of having to come up with goods both as the band's frontman and chief songwriter. I split down the middle, there's a songwriter and there's a performer and it'd be nice to get on with being a performer for a little bit because the last few weeks I've just been, I haven't slept, you know. It's hard writing songs, it's like a sickness, you know? but um, some people can't live without doing it. So. But rather like Tom of Casabayan, he hadn't really been surprised by his band's success. Well, we started in 2002 and the thing was just, you know, writing songs that, you know, I just wanted to, to tell the truth and write some songs that tell the truth about what goes on in, in your life. And um, we put, put the band together and um, I had this wonderful feeling of playing the right stuff. Clearly, they were still playing the right stuff two years later, when their second self-titled album went straight to the top of the UK charts. I found it totally liberated me to make the second record uh, because it was just like an extra shot of confidence, really. It was like extra belief, you know? When I was making the first record, it was quite confusing because I was pretty certain that we had a great band and we were going to make a great record in my own head. But at that point, it only existed in my own head. You know, and I had to go into the studio and prove that to, to the world. And then after you'd done that on the first one, going in for the second one was uh, so much easier because you're just like, um, I kind of been vindicated, you know, by the world. And I knew that, that I wasn't completely crazy. And uh, so, I, yeah, it just really sort of G'd me up to do the second album. Then in a relationship with Marie Antoinette star Kirsten Dunst, and with their first US number one single America in the bag, he was stoked to be playing the States. You know, to be up there with thousands and have thousands of people getting off on your songs and singing along with you and, uh, and giving you that energy back and you giving the energy to them and is, uh, is an amazing feeling. Trip-hop trio More Chiba started out in the mid-1990s when DJ Paul Godfrey and his multi-instrumentalist brother Ross met singer Sky Edwards at a party. Sky was so nervous when they first went into the studio, the boys decided to try and loosen her up a little. I remember when we recorded the song uh, Trigger Hippie um, and um, just listening to my vocals and I, I'd had two pints of, of Guinness and a, a, a prawn sandwich, and that is what you hear on, on, on the record. Their first album, Who Can You Trust, in 1996 spawned the singles Trigger Hippie, Never An Easy Way and Tape Loop, which failed to break the British Top 40, but helped them develop an underground following. Their next album, Big Calm, went to number 18 on the charts. Their breakthrough release of 1998 spawned an amazing five singles, including Blindfold and Part of the Process. Thankfully, Ross Godfrey wasn't forced to find a new day job. 
I've never really had any other plans and I've never had another job. I've always, always done music. And um, uh, a sort of naive self-belief that you're not going to fail, that always helps. Um, but obviously, if you do fail, then you probably feel pretty bad about it. But. Four years and two more top ten albums later, they were ready to release a compilation of some of their best songs with a DVD of their live shows. We've actually recorded like a whole DVD. Um, we chose to use three of the songs on the best of so people could kind of get a little inkling of what things are like. Because um, the best of compilation is very similar to our live set. You know, that's what we kind of play. We play a mixture of all four albums when we play live. And um, people should um, appreciate that we are a really good live band, you know, and that's what we do. And so if seeing this makes them want to come and see us live or buy our DVD, then that's great. In fact, that 2003 release was to be the last to feature the vocals of Sky, who has since gone on to pursue a solo career. The Godfrey brothers, meanwhile, have gone on to release The Antidote and 2008's Dive Deep. Taking their artwork imagery from the avant-garde movement in Russia, Scottish rockers Franz Ferdinand have been credited with leading Britain's recent resurgence in guitar-based music. The band was formed in Glasgow in 2002. Singer Alex Caprano and drummer Paul Thompson had already played together in other groups, while bass player Bob Hardy had been a long-time friend of Alex's. Guitarist Nick McCarthy joined up after studying jazz bass in Germany. According to Bob and Alex, Franz Ferdinand's organic formation is the major secret to their success. I only joint start a band with friends, really. You actually like. Yes. If you if you like as an advert in a newspaper and up randomly playing music with a bunch of guys, then you know six months on the road you might actually want to kill them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, like a lot of bands get together and, and even when they're rehearsing once a week, they still find that they wind each other up. So imagine what it's like sitting there on a bus like 24 hours a day, every day of the year. You've got to, you've got to be doing it with people, that, like Bob said, that you get on with, people that you like. And also don't take it too seriously either. It should be a good laugh, it should be fun. If it's not, then you shouldn't be doing it. They struck gold with their debut album back in 2003, which went in at number three on the British charts and earned them the prestigious Mercury Prize. They also won an MTV Breakthrough Award for the video to their top-selling single, Take Me Out. 2005 was spent in the recording studio. Coming up with their follow-up, you could have done it so much better with Franz Ferdinand. While some critics claimed their second effort sounded a bit rushed, the band was happy with the results. Well, I think on record, I think it's the, the second record that's got a lot more energy and uh, like captures more of the kind of live feeling of the band than the first record did. Yeah, um, that's probably true. Yeah, um, yeah and, and also probably learn to play our instruments a bit better now yeah. as well. This is, then, it's a richer, this is a richer sound. Their fans sent it straight to the top of the UK charts. Then they were off to conquer the rest of the world on tour. It's quite exciting that when, when you travel around the world and you, and you come across different audiences that have different attitudes, it means that you perform in a different way. You respond to the, the, the different people in different ways. And so, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited to see how people are. Uh, we were just in Japan and, and the, the, the Japanese audiences are very different from Western audiences and uh, they tend to stay very quiet between, well, during songs, which is very unusual. Like a Glasgow audience, for example, they never shut up. They never shut up and never stop throwing bottles of beer in the air. Three years later, they were celebrating the release of their third album, Tonight, Franz Ferdinand, with a free gig in a London record store. It debuted at number two in the UK and nine in the US. <laughs>